Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Marin Communications Forum. I'm Michelle Fidelli from First Five Marin, and we're very glad to have you with us today to talk about literacy, libraries, and equity. Um, really, um, we love, First Five Marin loves the Marin County Free Library and really interested to hear more about um, how involved they are in the whole community across the entire county and how the library really serves as a, a network and, and connector um, for all we're trying to do uh, for early literacy, lifelong literacy, lifelong learning. So it's gonna be a great day. Um, I wanna thank everyone that remembered to bring a book to donate. Thank you, Leslie, to her very, very favorite Chicka Chicka Boom Boom. Um, uh, if you didn't and you still would like to, no pressure, but feel welcome to donate to a library or friends of the library or any local organization. There are lots of them uh, around that would love to, uh, to share your new or probably gently gently worn and loved books um, with children in need, so thanks for that. Um, we're gonna begin this morning with Sarah Jones from the Marine County Free Library. Good morning, I'm so glad to be here, and as you um, notice, I'm so glad that we have such a good representation of our staff. And one thing that's important about that, that for most of you probably know this, that we're a pretty dispersed organization. So we have actually um, 11 facilities and um, now three vehicles. So folks that are um, across the whole county doing this service, we're able usually to get together, all of us together once a year. Um, that, that's really, and we have, uh, you know, as all of you would, we have a lot of teams and a lot of ways to continue to um, help uh, communicate and keep messages consistent. But it's, it's a challenge, so I'm certainly just absolutely thrilled to see staff here from all levels of the organization and all places that we serve. And I just want to, I want to start a little bit with um, the vehicles, because that is some, and uh, we're so thrilled to have the learning bus here and to have Ali and um, Maribel, they are awesome people who just stepped up and, and take that bus everywhere, including taking the old bus wherever it needs to go. So I highly encourage you to go see that. So the learning bus was renamed from the flagship. So the learning bus is an early literacy um, pre preschool on wheels. And uh, we have had that kind of activity for a very long time. And when this um, forum was planned, it was still in the two half to be happening, so I couldn't be happier that we're now in a place where we have this vehicle, it's serving um, people that would nor normally just not have any preschool opportunities, so we're thrilled about that. And then you might also want to know the former um, preschool literacy vehicle, which was called Flagship, Families Learning and Growing Together, has been already repurposed multiple times in the power outages as a comfort station. So because it has a generator, um, we were able to, we, we were parked at Marin City for the first power outage and the second power outage, giving people not only um, the ability to charge their devices, which was great, but we offered um, books and games and some other support things. So uh, we're, we're just thrilled that the flagship can be repurposed for that. It's at, you know, it's got a lot of miles on it, but I think it still can do um, services like that, so we're, we're thrilled about that. And then I'm often asked because people uh, think, are they have some confusion about the, the preschool vehicles and the bookmobile. So we still have the bookmobile, so the bookmobile is the white, quite large um, uh, vehicle that you might see all over, but you also will, if you drive through the first arch in the Civic Center, you'll see it there sometimes. So the bookmobile is really a library on wheels. So while it does all the things that all of our libraries do about serving libraries and literacy, it is specifically like a library. So you check books in and out. So uh, just a little clarification there. So I would like to begin today, though, a really kind of diving in about um, literacy, because I think it's a... Um, it's a word that uh, I think we use a lot, and it means a lot, and it really is, I, in a lot of ways for me, in my entire career in libraries, which is going on, um, you know, 
north of three decades, which seems absolutely impossible to me, but true. But for me, libraries and literacy have almost always been interchangeable terms. They really um, intersect in all kinds of ways. And I think that um, it drives us in terms of our services. Whether you are a lifelong lover of reading, that is still a literacy activity, or you're a beginning reader, or you're an adult uh, an adult person who doesn't know how to read. So it's really a huge spectrum. So I wanted to set the stage with giving the definition, the formal definition of literacy, which comes from UNESCO. And it is, literacy is the ability to identify, understand, interpret, create, communicate, and, com and compute using printed and written materials associated with varying contexts. Literacy involves a continuum of learning in enabling individuals to achieve their goals, to develop their knowledge and potential, and to participate fully in their community and society. So a very broad-based term, but I think as all of you um, connected uh, to the libraries as a worker, but connected to libraries in all other ways, can see when you come to come into the library or to any program how we fit in that definition. But I would like to just call out the 10 literacies that UNESCO calls out because I think it's important to know that um, you know, we don't default just to the ability to uh, read printed words. So the first uh, one that they've called out is digital literacy. That's not hard to figure out, right? The, um, all of us, I think, are challenged by digital literacy, even people who are, are really good in the digital environment and many, um, you know, we now have uh, multiple generations that are born, digital born natives. There are still a few of us who aren't digital born natives, but digital literacy, I mean, it, how many people avoid getting a new um, phone because you know that that learning curve is going to be really high. So it's uh, digital literacy is an ongoing activity that we have all the time. And then uh, media literacy is uh, number two, and that's just, you know, now we have all these other places and, you know, um, in terms of media, in terms of, you know, uh, blogs and, and Twitter and Facebook and, you know, TikTok, which I just learned about. And, but at the end of the day, you know, I, if there's anything more important, uh, I can't think of anything more important than media literacy because we are bombarded with um, inaccurate information during uh, um, dealing with social media. When I was in library school, which is um, going on 20 years ago, uh, one of the things that we were trained as librarians, and I know there's a lot of librarians that will identify with this training, is that when you sat at a reference desk and you were trying to um, identify whether something was true or not, you would try the the gold standard at that time, this so pre-internet, was if you could find three reputable, identical, uh, if you could find that source replicated three times with uh, sources that you knew to be accurate and um, true, then you could kind of say, yeah, that's a fact. Well, that's been completely thrown out the window now because I could find you, you I could find you a thousand, um, a thousand sources, you know, reputable we could have a lot of arguments about, but said we didn't go to the moon or that the 9-11 uh, um, was a hoax, or, or, or Sandy Hook. So media literacy is probably one of the more critical things that I think we're a, a challenge for all of us, and a challenge that hopefully libraries and literacy can step up for. Um, visual literacy, video photo maps. How many kids do you think aren't going to be able to pull out a big map and even figure out what north, south, east, and west is? Probably quite a few. And then, of course, for us, uh, you know, we have to learn the same way in a digital format. Um, number four is data literacy, so making informed decisions. Again, that's a place where people could argue that data is created to support things rather than we use data to go places. Uh, I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of argument that it's, it can be used both ways. This is a really interesting that you might not have thought about, but game literacy. So that's fine motor skills, problem solving, and navigation. So that actually could be from the very first part of game literacy of, you know, when you play Candyland with your kids and you figure out colors and numbers and things like that. But it's also now, um, there's a lot of uh, things, practical things that we need to do that are digital games to figure out. So it, there's a, a whole new world there too. Um, the sixth one is health and financial literacy. Again, a huge place for thinking about how uh, 
this kind of literacy is so important. I, my husband right now is trying to figure out what does he do about Medicare? What, what, how do you add on to it? How do you figure that out? He's a, a very well-educated man. It's a big struggle. So there's there, the, being able to, and not only that, but how do you, um, you know, how do you really look at your prescriptions? There's just a myriad of things of why we need really good health and financial literacy. Um, civics and ethical literacy. Again, a big underline in our current world about understanding our rights and responsibilities and not to be political here today, but at the end of the day, we are having ongoing conversation right now in our country about some basic things that I think a whole lot of us thought were we understood ethical, this is ethical, this is not, and now we're having a conversation where people are saying, well, it's a little ethical, that might be okay. So again, a place where uh, more important than ever that we have civic and ethical literacy. News literacy, again, you know, fake news and, and um, institutions that we absolutely said gave us the truth are now being maligned as enemies of the people. So there's a lot to go in terms of um, news literacy. Coding and computational literacy. So a lot of folks in, the, in um, both any kind of education knows that coding is going to be as an important basic skill as the ones that we grew up with. Can you read? Can you uh, write effectively? Can you speak effectively? This basic understanding of coding is going to be pretty necessary for generations in school right now and generations in the workforce right now. And then, of course, all of this is based on foundational literacy because everything I've read above and talked about above can't happen if we can't basically read and write. So that you often hear um, something about that you uh, learn to read up till third grade and then um, learn to read and then you read to learn past third grade. That's a, a, it's a, um, a saying that I think is very true. So all of those things that I talked about, if you can't read, the math is difficult. The, uh, all of these other things are extremely difficult. And just to put a, a pin in what's going on in our country is 36 million adults can't read or do math beyond third grade. That is a spectacularly um, bad number. And especially when you, everything I read above is that at the end of the day, if you can't read and you don't have all these functional literacies, then you let someone else make those decisions for you because you don't have the skill set yourself to do that. So it's fundamentally incredibly important that we uh, that we are able to work on literacy, the libraries, and in, and collectively. So um, our goals are deeply connected to libraries that saying that we develop and sustain and enhance literacy skills in a lifelong and community-wide endeavor. So one of the things that I wanted to chat with you a little bit today is how I see that happening before I turn it over to some of our folks that are going to dive quite a bit deeper. So one of the things, as you can see, it is um, at, from cradle to career. So I wanted to take just a brief moment about talking about our partnership with the uh, Marin Promise Partnership, and I know Anne is in the audience, and uh, I, I've been partnering in part of the collaboration of Marin Promise Partnership for I think a little more than three years, and uh, I got engaged first of all with being uh, third grade literacy just for the reasons that I, I mentioned above, but also you may have heard that it's um, uh, that, that level of literacy is so important that at one time, um, California looked at third grade literacy to look at how kind of prisons they were going to build because the, uh, if you're not literate, it's very difficult to be successful. It's very difficult to stay in school. It's very difficult to do, have a, uh, you know, even if you're not going to college, uh, any kind of technical career, you still have to have really high level reading skills. So I think that I was in, engaged, first of all, because that third grade was so important. But in all the conversations I had is we can't solve third grade at second or third grade. Third grade reading issues has to be solved from birth. And the advantages that some folks in our, in our world get and the disadvantages that other folks get them more and more behind from birth to uh, preschool to school to, to, you know, out of elementary school. That deficit 
just grows and gets really quite insurmountable. So I joined in that, meth in, in that endeavor and we've had um, really good partnerships working on that and some of our folks will tell you about that. And then just lately I wanted to call out a, a few documents that are in the back of the room and I'm hoping that you will um, get a chance to grab and look at. One that I think is really important is um, this report card which tells you where we are from cradle to career in, in, the, in the deficits and the gaps or the, the places where students are performing differently. So we know they perform differently in schools that have less resources, but we also know that the, the bigger determinant is a, a child's race. And so that, as what Marin promised partnership in, I think everyone in this room is involved in, is how do we, as a community, say that's not okay with us? How do we fix that? How do we find ways, working ways, using data, being able to um, understand what works well and how it could or could not be replicated um, in other places? The other things I wanted to point out is a couple of briefs. Um, again, the early grade literacy, so that third grade reading. and. Then also, um, they have deployed the West Marin Kindergarten Readiness Team. And again, so many of you in the room are part of these collaborations, and we are making and seeing some real difference. And the difference to me, the reason why that matters so much is because it's about us all working together. So if it, for me, when I look at how collective impact can have um, a major uh, way to move this issue, it's to, bring the village in so that we all have a common goal and that is to make sure every child has opportunity in education and it takes all of us, libraries and schools and community-based partnerships and really everyone, parents and grandparents and people who are willing to come in and, and help kids learn to read. It takes all of those folks to make that um, possible. So I just want to call that out and I really hope that you will walk away and look at these um, uh, these pieces and if there's any part that you would like more information about either myself or Anne would be happy uh, Happy to talk to you about that. So now I'm going to shift gears and get close to introducing um, the f other folks at the library so a number of years ago um, Actually when I first came on board which is going on about six and a half years ago We did a community assessment and what happened in the community assessment is about I think the number was somewhere around 85% of the people that we asked um, You know what should the library be doing? They said you should be partnering with education So there is this isn't something that I came to Marin and said we should be partnering with education Although I'm a passionate advocate for that, but we asked the community and the community really said that's that's a, a very central role. You might remember that in, in addition to that community assessment, we did polling um, to see if we could pass our Measure A, which we did pass very successfully, and the polling said the same thing. So we had a community assessment that said, hey, uh, Marin County Free Library, you need to really be um, focusing on education and then the polling, and then when we pass that measure, then I think what we had to do is deliver on that promise. And so I think we have some really great um, steps in that. One is, uh, we mentioned before, is the ability to replace that preschool vehicle with a beautiful uh, bus that is going to be so engaging for families and children to um, join and to be even more excited about their early literacy efforts. We also have a number of school library partnerships and uh, some folks are gonna tell you more about that. But we were able to actually, in addition to um, running libraries, which is a big thing in the first place, we have indicated folks that have uh, the title of education initiatives coordinator and they have the responsibility to work with all the partners to make sure that we are just, we are moving that, um, that goal that we all have is that every child has, every child and every person has equal opportunity in this, um, in our community and what, what we can do uh, to make sure that that is in fact true. We have also been really trying to uh, shift thinking and mindset and resources towards making sure that we're, we use collective impact and we're deeply engaged with all partners, but also the thoughts of what are traditional about libraries that maybe are negative about um, advancing equity. So you might have noticed that a number of years ago, I think in 2014, we let go of all fines on children's books, which was, a, it, it was it, it, the intended outcome was exactly as we expected. We had families return to the libraries who hadn't been coming because of the fines being a detriment. 
and we had um, readership gain. So based on that and based on um, some trending that, that fines really are a, a barrier to library services, in July 1st, we let go of all fines across the whole organization. And <laughs> yay! And we absolutely know that those kind of things, that, that fines have a lot of reasons they're barriers. Obviously, the biggest one is the financial one. And that people, um, our intention is to buy the resources and for you all to use the resources that the library buys. So fines really are counterproductive to that. They also um, take a lot of time as you might imagine from the staff perspective of gathering them and making sure everything balances. So we don't have to do that anymore and we, we really believe and national studies have shown that you almost spend as much money in the gathering and accounting for than you do in the actual deposit of the fines for you know, benefit of the organization. So I'm really proud of what we do in terms of literacy and equity, and I'm incredibly proud of the fact that we are um, in partnership with so many folks, and now I'm gonna turn it over to our education initiatives coordinators. I, I, you guys are coming, is that, okay. So we have um, Amy Sunny from the South Novato Library, and she has deep partnerships with the Novato Unified School Districts and in partnership with uh, XR Libraries and XR Learn with the Marin County Office of Education. We have uh, Diana Lopez, she is the Marin City Library Branch Manager, and she um, is overseeing in, the, uh, in addition to her branch in Marin City, the school library in Bayside MLK. And we have Ramona Little-Taylor, who is the manager out in West Marin. She's a, a deep partner in the kindergarten readiness. We are also um, supporting and managing the library at the Nicasio School. So they're gonna dive a little bit deeper, but um, these uh, uh, three librarians are doing amazing work in moving uh, our agenda forward. So there you go. Hi, everyone. I'm Ramona Little-Taylor, and I am the mother of a five-year-old, Nico, who, that's my most important role um, in life. And I'm also the branch manager and education initiative coordinator for West Marin Libraries, which include Point Reyes, Inverness, Bolinas, and Stinson Beach. And I also manage the West Marin Literacy Services Program and the Learning Bus, which is formerly the flagship. I'm honored to share the stage with my colleagues and fellow Education Initiatives Coordinators, Amy Sunny, Branch Manager of South Novato, and Diana Lopez, the Branch Manager of Marin City. So who we are, as Sarah mentioned, in addition to being branch managers and dealing with building maintenance and scheduling and staffing and all of the um, typical duties in a library, we also are Education Initiatives Coordinators. Marin County Education Initiatives Libraries, o librarians oversee pre-K to 12 educational partnerships, we manage joint school and community partnerships, and we also integrate 21st century learning, including maker spaces and immersive reality. This position is a keystone of the library's racial equity action plan to reduce educational disparities for students of color, to support low-income families, and to ensure outcomes around grade level reading, digital literacy, and youth leadership. Our responsibilities include, we manage branches and school partnerships in high need regions. We design and implement education initiatives that prioritize equity and inclusion. We create and sustain meaningful and productive partnerships with pre-K to 12 schools. And we also support 21st century learning, including digital literacy, project-based learning, and immersive learning environments. We of course do not do this alone. We work with highly skilled, passionate staff, many of whom are in this room right now, who advance equity, early literacy, and 21st century learning, from maker spaces to preschools, to STEAM programs and virtual reality. In support of the library's mission and, obje and objectives, <coughs> excuse me, we increase kindergarten readiness and third grade reading success through our partnerships and interventions. We promote youth leadership and racial equity and youth services across the county. We create targeted education programs and partnerships to promote 21st century learning outcomes and STEAM education. And we engage students, parents, and their caregivers in opportunities for self-development and independent learning. That includes great attention to diversity in our collections across the county, not just in neighborhoods with higher percentage of communities of color. I'd like to share a quote from Marin Promise, our partner in educational equity. 
Marin is a county of 250,000 people. We enjoy incredible beauty and are fortunate to be the wealthiest, healthiest, best educated county in the state. However, we also have the greatest educational achievement gap in California. Despite our abundance, we have not yet figured out how to ensure that all children reach their full educational potential, especially English language learners and those from low income, African American and Hispanic and Latino families. I'd like to highlight a few areas where we as educational initiatives coordinators are working on educational equity. In West Marin, um, our libraries are focused on building and strengthening our partnerships with the Shoreline Unified School District, Bellina Stinson School, and Acasio School, which is our latest formal education partner. One of the focus areas for educational equity is kindergarten readiness. In the Shoreline Unified School District, only 33% of students of color received a ready-to-go score, which means that they would require no interventions, um, educational interventions in kindergarten. I currently serve on the West Marin Kindergarten Action Team for Marin Promise, and we're identifying factors, barriers, and strategies to support students of color and close the opportunity gap by 2028. This team includes preschool directors, the library, principals, community centers, school superintendents, teachers, and early childhood educators and advocates. We are working as a collective to advance educational equity, specifically as, as it relates to kindergarten readiness. And I think one of the most, um, one of our strengths in the library regarding kindergarten readiness is our learning bus program, which was formerly flagship. Our program continues to grow and provide K readiness activities for students all over the county of Marin, including in our three target areas of West Marin, Novato, and Marin City. In case you haven't heard, which you have, we have a brand new bus with a brand new name. Thanks to generous support from the County of Marin, the Marin Community Foundation, and the Marin County Library Foundation, as well as all the voters of Marin who supported Measure A. We also have to always say a special thank you to First Five Marin and the Parent Services Project for their ongoing and long-term support of this program. The Learning Bus is not a bookmobile, though it has many books on board. The Learning Bus is a free drop-in mobile preschool program, and Alejandra Cruz is our amazing program coordinator. Let's give it up for Alejandra. <laughs> she drives all over the county in some of the highest need areas and delivers K-readiness, and is just an amazing person to work with, and I'm honored to work with her. She, directly, she also directly delivers bilingual activities that support early childhood development through exploration, stories, songs, games, art, and lots of fun. Our classes on the learning bus are designed for children zero to five years old, and they provide a great opportunity for the parents to engage with their children while preparing them for school. It's important to note that Alejandra is a preschool teacher with a deep understanding of childhood development best practices and early literacy. We are so proud of our new bus and our program. We have 10 weekly stops, and each class is an hour and 15 minutes, and students are engaged in social emotional learning, cognitive learning, concepts, language and literacy, and more. We also provide weekly bilingual story times at the Point Reyes Library, and bi-weekly outreach to our partner preschools in West Marin, which include the Paper Mill Creek Children's Corner, Bellina Stinson Children's Center, Bellina Stinson School, and the Inverness School TK to One program. Another focus area for the education initiative coordinators is third grade reading. In the Shoreline School District, only 21% of students of color met or exceeded the Common Core Standard for third grade reading. This year, we partnered with the Nicasio School to update their library collection and provide library cards to all students. Sarah Jones signed an MOU with the school that outlined a three-year partnership that includes dedicated funding from Nicasio to support updating the library collection and the first phase of this project was heavily focused on the collection. It had been over five years since the library, um, since a new book order was placed. If you can imagine an entering kindergarten, kindergartner not getting a new book in their school library until fifth grade, that's what they had. With the help from staff at all levels, we heavily weeded the library And Sarah Jones and I, along with the Point Reyes staff, we met with every student and teacher to ask them what their dream library would look like. And we got input on the types of books they wanted in their library. 
We sign them up for library card and for staff members to students and our team of library selectors, shout out to Clara, she's here, um, ordered 300 new books which were barcoded and cataloged in their ILS system. Teachers and students were, thrill were thrilled with the updates. At our library card reveal event, um, one little girl came up to me at the library and she said how happy she was with the updated library and that she really loves it now. Another way we are supporting students reading at grade level is that our West Marin Literacy Services program piloted a new after school reading program called Reading Buddies, which has expanded to Marin City in South Nevada this school year. Anne Marie Russo is our program coordinator and the program utilizes volunteer tutors, looking at all of you who said you were volunteers, there, we have opportunities. The program utilizes volunteer tutors to provide K to third graders with one-on-one -on -one informal tutoring to help meet third grade reading milestones by reading or being read to for 20 minutes a day outside of school. Last year, we started with a small cohort of five students, and this year we're serving between 20 to 25 students each week with guided reading support. They receive 15 to 20 minutes of one-on-one -on -one tutoring with a volunteer tutor, many of whom are retired educators or teachers, principals, um, community members who just have a strong interest in supporting youth. And then they rotate to our group literacy area where they can play literacy games, do writing exercises, or storytelling in small groups. There are some really great stories that they tell. Last year, one of the first great teachers shared that she was seeing gains with one student who was struggling to engage with reading. For collection development that supports third grade reading, we've purchased Bebop book sets, which are leveled easy reader books that include diverse representation, cultural authenticity, and own voices authors. All of these titles are published in English and Spanish. We also have our Reading on the Ranches program, which is our summer reading program for children who are living on remote ranches in West Marin. Since many of the students lack access to transportation during the summer, we bring summer reading to them with weekly visits for six weeks that includes book delivery to ranches from Inverness to Tamales. This past summer, we reached 98 children who checked out 711 books. We expanded our program to support early learning and K-readiness by lending play kits with Play-Doh, magnetic letters, and early learning activities. We also hosted a Summer National Parks canoeing trip for teens on the ranches to Abbott's Lagoon in partnership with the Point Reyes National Seashore Association. Though Abbott's Lagoon is in their backyard, none of the students had ever been canoeing. We hired three teen aides for the summer who live in the community and they assisted the program coordinator and we're excited to continue bringing books to Latinx and Hispanic families who are living on the ranches who face transportation challenges and lack of access to resources during the summer. For 21st century literacy and STEAM, we are working to bring more 21st century programs to West Bend students since, as I mentioned, transportation is a huge issue and many of them can't get to our beautiful and amazing maker space, which is in Novato. Um, this is an issue of access and rural students are often left out of STEAM initiatives that occur in central Monrin. We provided STEAM workshops and our libraries and for our school partners by bringing the Bay Area Discovery Museum's Try It Truck, Virtual Reality, Oculus Go's provided by XR Libraries, Cubelets and Ozobots that teach coding and most recently Little Bits which teach basic circuitry to children and teens. Now I would like to introduce my colleague Diana Lopez Diana received one of our profession's highest honors last year. She was awarded or dubbed a mover and shaker from the Library Journal, which is our professional journal. <laughs> She's a fearless and tireless advocate for the community of Marin City, especially children and their families. Thank you, Ramona. Good morning, everybody. So in Marin City, we focus on community partnerships to address equity and opportunity gaps. Uh, for third grade reading at Bayside, excuse me, Bayside MLK Academy, only 18% of students of color met or exceeded the common core standard for third grade reading. We have a formal agreement with the Sausalito Marin City School District to have oversight at the Bayside MLK Library. This is our third year of this agreement. Through this agreement, we have an embedded staff member who is partially funded by the district and also by a generous donation to the Marin City Library. The previous library tech only worked 14, 15 hours per week, so we've more than doubled uh, library hours and access in the school. 
We did a thorough weeding of the school library collection and invested well over $5,000 in new, culturally relevant, updated materials. I too would like to give a shout out to Clara, our children's selector, who has been phenomenal in helping me select uh, materials for the school library. A second library staff member on campus runs the Smarty Ants software-based reading program with supplemental print curriculum for TK through third grade students as part of the campus after-school programs. We recently launched Reading Buddies at Bayside MLK in conjunction with Smarty Ants. We also have Reading Buddies volunteers at Willow Creek Academy as part of their after-school program there and a volunteer that comes to Marin City Library. Marin City, as you may know, is the only place in the county that has family public housing. We have a partnership with Marin Housing Authority on the Book Rich Environment Initiative, which is a collaboration between nonprofit organizations, national government agencies, and corporate publishers, and is run by the National Book Foundation. The goal is to give books to children in public housing and other underserved communities so that kids have access to books in their homes and can have their own personal library. The Urban Libraries Council and HUD's Library Partnerships and Book Rich Environments Initiative named our partnership one of three bright spots in the nation that were working towards equity and promoting literacy. During 2017, thanks. <laughs> During 2017 through the end of 2019, we will have given away 8,000 books as part of the Book Rich Environment Initiative. Each year we hold community-wide events to give away these books. Our most popular event is Books and Barbecue, which we usually have in the summer at Rocky Graham Park with the support from community partners, including friends of the Marin City Library, Marin County Sheriff's Office, Marin County Fire Department, Bridge the Gap, Hannah Project, Performing Stars of Marin, community churches, and many more. We also maintain a book giveaway cart at a local laundromat with books from the Book Rich Environment Initiative. With regard to kindergarten readiness, we have weekly story times that our local preschools and Head Start children attend. With funds from a recent bequest, we are establishing a library of learning games and we'll also be um, adding to the collection at both the branch library and the school library at Bayside MLK. As part of our literacy and equity work with the Marin Housing Authority, for the last three years, we participated in Read for the Record. It's the world's largest simultaneous read. Uh, each year, a picture book is, a different picture book is chosen. I coordinate read-in events at the two schools in our district, Bayside MLK and Willow Creek Academy. And I invite the preschools and Head Start programs to participate. Each child in attendance gets a copy of the book and a themed literacy and activity guide. For 20th, 21st century literacy in STEAM, we secured a $10,000 California State Library Innovation Station grant, which we used to purchase an awe literacy, early literacy station, as well as STEAM equipment and materials for the Bayside MLK Library. We participate in a wraparound summer program in collaboration with our Marin City partners, Bayside MLK, Hannah Projects Freedom School, Bridge the Gap, and Marin City Community Services District with community goals and strategies. Each week, we run a different hands-on STEAM activity for the kids in this summer program. We also continue our Smarty Ants program throughout the summer as part of this collaboration. We have weekly digital literacy classes through a partnership with a very generous community member and volunteer and Bayside MLK and Marin City Community Services District. Um, oops, sorry, and Performing Stars of Marin. I can't forget Felicia, Felicia's amazing. Uh, kids have learned to code and most recently made light up scarves that they program themselves to display various colors and light patterns. We're in the process of purchasing 25 laptops for Bayside MLK Library and are working with school tech staff to set up access to databases provided for free to K through 12 public schools by the California State Library. Once we have all of this in place, we will expand class, vi class visits to the library uh, to include instruction for kids and teachers on how to use the databases and how to evaluate information on the internet. We have a long-term Wi-Fi hotspot and Chromebook loan for students who don't have internet access at home. 
Um, and uh, lastly, but um, certainly not least, I, we have a wonderful um, gentleman, Etienne Douglas, who runs our Webstar uh, program. And these are high school kids who are employed by the library. Um, he teaches them um, about computers. They learn how to do 3D printing, how to code, how to create websites, how to work with um, different library um, platforms like our, our eBooks. Uh, and then they work one-on-one -on -one with um, patrons that come in. So if you get a if you get a tablet or something for Christmas and you don't know how to use it, come on by. We'll help you. Um, this is our final year of the agreement with the Sausalito Marin City School District. So we really um, are we're very we're in a, I think we're in a good position with them right now. We recently have a new um, superintendent who's amazing and a very engaged uh, principal. So we're hoping to continue our partnership. Um, and we're always looking for ways to, um, to improve. So now I'm gonna introduce Amy Sunny, the Education Initiatives Coordinator and Branch Manager of the fabulous South Nevada Library. We collaborate. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a real treat to get to talk about our work all together um, and in a room with so many of our partners and our colleagues here. So yay, thank you for having us. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, the work that's happening at South Novato and in the Novato libraries overall. Um, as you'll hear, some of the things that we're doing um, are pretty similar and coordinated with my colleagues up here on this stage. So I'll try not to be too repetitive. <laughs> um, but I think it is just a testament to Sarah Jones' vision in creating these education initiatives positions um, for us to occupy, for us to be able to work as a team, and for us to be able to collaborate with the rest of the Marine County Free Library staff and all of our community partners, um, that we are really able to leverage the best of what we each have to offer, um, build off of each other's work, coordinate, um, and come up with some best practices and some really localized approaches to dealing with issues of literacy and to address disparities in access to educational opportunities. Um, so at both Novato Downtown Library um, and the South Novato Libraries, we're working closely with Novato Unified School District and community partners to close opportunity gaps for students, to promote early literacy, and to engage families. Um, some of our partners include 10,000 Degrees, the Marin County Office of Education, XR Libraries, which Sarah Jones mentioned earlier, the YMCA, First Five, and Homeward Bound. Um, we also do a lot of collaboration with the school libraries in Novato, and I just want to put a plug out there. As you heard from my colleagues, they've been helping to update and establish school libraries. In Novato, we're lucky that many of our schools do have libraries, um, and I want to give a shout out to Laura Kennett, who each year organizes a collaboration with the library staff at the schools. Um, to, again, you know, leverage our professional expertise, hear from them and what they're seeing at the schools, um, offer book recommendations, and do a little bit of a, you know, best of the books coming out this year. Um, and to really have that collaboration with the school libraries is so critical because school libraries and public libraries both play such an important role in literacy for our communities. Um, so our efforts on educational equity are really a work in progress. We're constantly asking, how can we serve students and families more? How can we ensure more youth voice and parent voice in what we do? Uh, where do we need to make shifts in the resources and our approach? Uh, spoiler alert, when you shift resources to address disparities, you actually do see results. Over the last few years, we've shifted significant resources in Marin County as a whole, but specifically in Novato, to strengthen service to low-income communities and communities of color while enriching our city as a whole. We have ensured all NUSD students have library cards. Yes, that meant 7,500 plus cards in one year. <laughs> um, so that was a big shout out to both. <laughs> the Novato and South Novato team right before I came on board. So <laughs> I missed that fun. Um, but we've also created hundreds of cards since and really tried to work on uh, promoting cards for parents and whole families as well. 
We've ensured our staff programs and collections reflect the communities that we've served. Um, that includes more and more bilingual books, more and more diverse books, as my colleagues talked about. We've launched a youth jobs program, building on the WebStars program. Um, now at South Nevada, we have a youth technology jobs program. Uh, ours is called XR Stars, but very similar. Um, and we have a new bilingual reading circle happening at the Nevada downtown branch, hosted by our colleague, Sylvia. Um, we've also looked at ways to deepen summer learning for kids and families. This is something we're looking at again and again. As a testament to our outreach, we saw high numbers of new visitors at both Novato branches last summer, notably among the 30% of uh, attendees or visitors who took the survey in Spanish, more than 40% were new visitors to the library. At South Novato, we also have a formal agreement with NUSD and a nonprofit called XR Marin, XR Libraries, New Media Learning. They have several names. <laughs> um, and we run an innovative joint use library and makerspace. Um, so, collaborating with our nonprofit partners, the school district, and the county library, we have 12,000 square feet of learning and new media space in South Novato. Um, this is massively bigger than the library we had before in the Hamilton neighborhood, um, and our programs are growing as a result. We focus on 21st century learning, and it's really, really a model for the nation. We include daily after-school programs in our makerspace. That means uh, just last month, I can say, we um, promoted more than 500 learning interactions for about 120 students. We have educational programs using immersive reality for both kids and adults. Uh, we have class visits that combine both reading and STEAM learning. Um, so you can ask me later about our Three Little Pigs engineering challenge, um, which anyone can do anywhere and really just involves a blow dryer and lots of different materials. And it's quite, <laughs> it's quite fun. Uh, the kindergartners at Hamilton loved it. <laughs> uh, in particular, we've also dedicated and shifted resources to close gaps based on race and income when it comes to third grade reading. Um, I have the honor to serve on the third grade action team with Marin Promise Partnership. Um, and just a big shout out to Marin Promise and Anne back there um, for the collaborative action model that they are using. Um, among NUSD school students, 63% of low-income students and more than 50% of students of color face barriers to third grade reading. For English learners, that number can be closer to 90%. And at some schools, including the schools closest to South Novato, those numbers are significantly higher. So what are we doing about it? Um, first, we've been working within uh, NUSD and the YWCA or YMCA, to dive deep each summer um, to prevent summer slide and help students gain reading level by supporting Novato's Camp University program for English language learners. It's about 200 to 250 students each summer. So we embed literacy support programs and send hundreds of free books home with students each year. Working together, we've seen measurable reductions in summer slide and even reading gains. Um, we're working on different ways to measure that, um, but in one summer, we were able to measure that 92% of students who participated in our literacy intervention gained or maintained a reading level. We also provide maker workshops and classes, prioritize bilingual family programs, and celebrate families learning together. Last summer, we did 42 programs at the South Novato Library Branch. Most of those were family learning programs, including a significant proportion of programs that were intentionally bilingual. We hosted 18 class visits um, over to Camp University, including maker workshops, and we got 33 new parents signed up for library cards, which is pretty great. Um, second, we're also working closely with Novato schools, um, all Novato schools, to develop aligned strategies. And I particularly want to just lift up our partnership with Hamilton Meadow Park. Last year, we more than doubled our engagement with the school um, through book clubs, after school programs, uh, a program called Kinder Tales that focused on building a love of reading for kindergartners. And we also, also offered weekly coding workshops um, with our makerspace coordinator, Sarah Baldick. I really can't say enough great things about the staff at Hamilton, from Principal Steve to Delmarice, Beatriz, and all the teachers. Um, still, we needed to keep asking, you know, how do we do more for the students at the school? What do families need from us most? Steve and I talked a lot last year about what would help K-3 students um, before they were, you know, being measured as falling behind in third grade. And we talked about a reading intervention for first and second graders. It was only 10 or 12 students um, that we were talking about serving, but due to staff capacity issues, there wasn't much that we could do last year. Um, 
but remember that lesson about shifting resources. Um, I spent the year working with my colleagues, um, figuring out ways that we could shift focus and shift resources to expand the Reading Buddies program that West Marin piloted to South Nevada. And we were able to do it. So this month, we uh, launched the Reading Buddies program, providing one-on-one -on -one tutoring for 23 students, uh, almost double the number that we had hoped to reach. The vast majority are from Hamilton. Um, we could not have done this without the collaborative education initiatives approach that you're seeing demonstrated up here, without the support of our administration, and a, without a lot of community partners, um, including the, all the people around the table at the Marin Promise Partnership. Um, so for us, that, that included having Hamilton help us connect with parents directly to register the students who needed us most. Dominican University sent us amazing volunteers. Um, the county helped us recruit additional volunteers. 10,000 Degrees supported with training the volunteers. And our entire team at the library got behind the effort. So this is really, to me, collaborative action in practice. Um, like Sarah said, she called it the village, right? It, it's definitely the village in practice. And and it's taking all of that village to help us serve these families and these students. So we now offer tutoring every single day of the week. And we have a wait list for the program. We're seeing families come in wanting to register the rest of the kids in the family. We actually have one family that has four students involved in the program, a set of twins, an older sister, and a cousin. Um, and after conducting parent surveys um, through the schools as well, we learned that parents were really looking for tutoring and education for themselves. And so we worked together, um, again, with our partners and with volunteers from the Ring Community Foundation and some of our staff to launch ESL classes for parents. So we now have two ESL classes per week, and we are seeing about half of the people enrolled in those ESL classes are the parents of our reading buddies. Um, we're seeing new families using the library through this program. We're seeing new um, families using the library through all of our outreach in general. Um, and we're really, really happy that we're able to serve families as whole families. Um, through Marin Promise and the third grade action team, I feel like we're really able to compound um, and leverage our impact. I'll say, um, having worked in adult literacy as well as youth literacy before, thank you, Susan, for supporting the adult literacy work. Um, I, I've been part of consortia and you know these kinds of action tables before where people are coming around the table to um, avoid duplicating work, to be more efficient, to leverage resources, kind of in some ways you know wanting to do the best, but uh, it, you know, I think in some ways you know just trying to like work from a scarcity mindset. It's the opposite that I see happening here in Marin. We don't need to operate from a scarcity mindset, and everything that I see happening from First Five to the Third Grade Action Team to the Marin Promise Network, it isn't about just reducing duplication. It's about figuring out how we can serve students and how we can serve families in more places, in more ways, all together more effectively instead of just efficiently. So I want to say thank you. Um, for the opportunity to be a part of that work and to really see a table um, of people come together in that way for that purpose, because I do think serving students as whole people and serving families as whole families and making those one-to-one -one connections and relationship buildings is the way we're gonna move the needle on these educational disparities, so thank you. I'm gonna, we're gonna uh, take a couple questions now, and if you all can share the microphone, we'll go around. Um, did anyone have a question or a comment that they wanted to ask about local programs? Uh, Dave Bonfilio, First Five Commissioner. Um, 20 years ago, uh, after much internal debate, First Five bought the flagship, and we have been a funding partner ever since. Uh, and Amy, I am so glad to hear you talk about the whole family and the fact that if we raise the most needy among us, we raise the whole community, because that's what First Five is all about. Thank you very much. Question over on the other side. Rachel Hertz, San Rafael City Schools. Maybe. There you go. Thanks. 
Um, just want to give a shout out to Pickleweed for um, we had a situation that they became aware of that our high school. Sorry, just swap that out. Thank you. That our high school students um, were trying to complete college application information and were cut off on the computers for 30 minutes. And as soon as they realized what was happening, they extended the time based on their student ID. So thank you. Um, are the other sites have similar policies or programs? I know some have Chromebooks, some have. It seems to be sort of a different type of approach at each of the libraries, and I was wondering if there's been thought about um, aligning that. Um, so I can speak for both the Novato libraries that we share resources quite a lot. Actually, we have six of their <laughs> Chromebooks right now. Um, and we do, and you know, Laura Kenton and I do uh, sit down and meet and talk about youth services for the city as a whole. Um, I think looking outside of our three branches, um, we work very closely through our Children's Services Committee and our Teen Services Committee to talk about the work that we're all doing and to talk about ways that that same educational equity approach can inform what's happening happening at different branches. I think it's also important to note, though, that you know each community does have different needs. Um, and so you know some of what you're talking about with you know high school students uh, getting ready to take the SAT or apply for college or do the FAFSA or whatever, that's going to look different at my library than it might look at another library. Um, but we do all share resources. And so libraries that maybe have more of a teen population and more students who you know need help with the FAFSA, they're going to bring in somebody to do some of that work with those kids branches who, you know, have maybe a younger population. We have a lot of middle schoolers, you know, so we have slightly different programs. But we do, you know, as much as we can work to align our services and then really tailor it to each community. I don't know if that's helpful. Um, Pickleweed actually isn't part of our of the county system. It's part of the San Rafael Public Library, um, which is the city branch. But um, I have reached out to Josh, um, who sadly is moving on to Oakland, but he's been amazing the last few years. But I do um, share resources with him. Um, and so like with the Book Rich Environment Initiative books, um, because we get a massive delivery in, roughly around the March, uh, March time. And I mean, it's a pallet delivery. It's a huge, huge delivery. Uh, and so I, I invite him to come and select books to give out to his community as well. And I just wanted to share, having worked at a couple of libraries, um, including Fairfax, um, I think to get to your question of, um, I guess the technical question of extending time, I think that every librarian and library assistant I've ever worked with would never behold time from a student or someone filling out an important um, document. I think we do, being flexible and adaptable is in our job description. So <laughs> I think that we do um, make accommodations um, frequently um, that are outside of the technical policy to make sure we're supporting students and families and anyone who's really, I mean, we've extended time for someone who's completing a job application. Um, I think that we do make those adjustments to support the community in the way that's needed. Another question? Hi, my name is Susan Clark, and um, first of all, I'm just full of admiration and gratitude. All of this is just like a litany of wonderful practices and partnerships, so thank you for that. Um, I think, um, as Amy mentioned, my interest is a lot in parent engagement um, and how um, parents are not only recipients of services, but um, how in your partnerships are parents um, also being recognized not just as having needs, um, but maybe, you know, their opportunities to grow as grassroots leaders. And, and I'm just, you know, how does that figure into to your work? So um, in Marin City, um, my Kayla Thompson, who's my embedded um, community library specialist that runs the school library there, um, she and the new community uh, school community coordinator, um, they have recently launched a parent student like a PTA, I forget what the acronym is, but it's but it's a, the PTA, because based at MLK hasn't had a PTA. Um, so we're really happy that that's going on and, and we'll be supporting that in our community. And on the West Marine Kindergarten Action Team, um, which Belandra is also on, and she represents Parent Services Project as their ED, um, 
parent engagement and seeing the parents as their own advocates and their their student their child's first teacher is first and foremost. And Belandra keeps all of us really focused on that because Parent Services Project is um, really focused on parent engagement. Um, but that's when we look at the barriers and factors um, that influence kindergarten readiness, um, it's not just saying these are ways we can help parents, it's how can parents actually support that. And I don't wanna speak on behalf of Parent Services Project, because they will be speaking, but that is a key source is that the parents, we're supporting the parents, not um, seeing them as def deficient, um, but seeing them as the, their parents, their child's first teacher. Um, and that's a very critical role. And I think that all of the action teams honor that. Um, and I'm, even in some of the meetings, we've had community parents who come into the action team um, and share their experience with um, kindergarten readiness or third grade literacy. And I think that's hugely important. Also for the Learning Bus, formerly flag Flagship, it is a program for the parents and the child. Um, it's not drop off. The kids aren't just put on the bus with Alejandra and the parents are, you know, um, leave. Um, the parents are there and Ale, as the coordinator, supports them and offers them resources um, and connects them. She serves as a community connector and connects the parents um, and makes sure that they are, again, the child's first teacher um, and probably the most important teacher that they'll ever have. Um, so I think that's one way that we support the parents as collaborators. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just wanna add, like, I think for us, for, and a lot of our communities, particularly in the, in the communities that the three of us serve, and also in, in Pickleweeds and the Canal District, our, our families are really struggling, and a lot of them are working multiple jobs to get by, so, um, you know, we have to keep those kinds of things in mind when, when we work to support uh, the families as well. Um, I really appreciate your question and want to say that I think this is the area we have um, the most opportunity to grow, um, particularly in this county where there's not a lot of grassroots leadership building and organizing. I think uh, my call to action would be to support the organizations that are doing it. North Marin Community Services has parent um, leadership um, programs, uh, grassroots leadership. There's some programs in West Marin. MOC um, is doing that and Lizzie Gore um, who is on the Marin Promise uh, action teams, um, is doing some of that work at different schools. They're in San Rafael, they're trying to build in Novato, really sitting down and talking to parents, talking to families about what do you need. What, let's talk about housing, let's talk about healthcare, let's talk about, you know, does your kid need reading glasses? Like um, starting with those kinds of basics and really putting parents um, in the driver's seat around solving the social problems that sit right adjacent to any of the educational barriers. Um, and I think that there's a lot of opportunity to do more community organizing style work that puts parents and adults in the driver's seat, but also youth, um, using like the Youth Leadership Institute model and things like that, um, in solving the kinds of problems that directly connect to uh, what's happening in schools, whether it's hunger, whether it's housing. Um, and so I, I think that it's a great question and a real opportunity for growth. Good morning. Again, um, I'm Lorenzo Cordova and I work for Supervisor Dennis Rodoni and I just have to echo what this room has been saying over and over, the wonderful work that all of you do to support our you know, most vulnerable residents. And I also want to point out that it's critically important to have librarians that look like the people that we serve and for our, this wonderful group on stage to be representative of our population, I think that is one huge step forward and I have to just give kudos to our library and to Sarah for just making that a mission of the organization. Um, I guess for us as your community partners here that support, are here to support your work, how can we better support the work that you do on a daily basis? What, in what ways can we enhance your mission or the work that you do with your students and your families? Because I think the people in this room are, are ready to support you and to help you continue to succeed. Great. First, thank you. Um, <laughs> I think that there are a couple of ways um, and I think that our admin team is really good at leveraging. Um, I think that supporting, you know, I won't lie, financial support is always appreciated and needed. Um, and our community library foundation, or 
County Library Foundation is a great resource. Um, our assistant director, Chantel Walker, can guide you in that process. Um, so I think that funding is real um, because these some of the communities that we're serving, um, there is a real lack of resources, which I mean, you're well aware of, Supervisor Rodoni is, in terms of West Marin, um, that I think funding is key. So that's one way. I think, too, um, we as a collaborative need to become better at articulating what we need. Um, I think we need to develop a wish list that can just be on the website that includes volunteer opportunities, ways to support, um, materials that we need. I think that that's a to-do for us is to better articulate our needs. We're sort of building the, the plane while driving it. Um, so, <laughs> so that's uh, fun. And um, I don't know if do you all have anything. Yeah, it's never boring. The holidays are coming up, so maybe we can work on the wish list over the next month. There's lots of people who'd like to give. And I think one, um, one thing that I would like to add is that I think it's vitally important in Marin County, there are lots of issues that rise to the top, and I think that supporting children um, frequently doesn't. And so I think that's something that we can ask of all of you, is that it's vitally important that the community as a whole support children and their families, and that that become an advocacy issue. Um, because you know we shouldn't have to figure out how to get enough books in the home. You know That shouldn't be as big of a heavy lift as it is. And so I think that part of that is becoming better advocates and better articulating the needs um, for children in Marin County, especially those in our three disadvantaged areas um, who are really lacking in resources and support and advocates, advocates beyond their families. Okay, thank you for your wonderful panel and all your questions. And we're going to have Bonnie Barron um, start her part. Thanks, everyone. Uh, good morning. Thanks for your flexibility and your patience. Yay. It worked. Um, I, pre I feel grateful to be here this morning. I don't very often get to talk in Marin County about the work we're doing um, with this countywide initiative, which everyone should know about this countywide initiative. It's called P3 early school success. How many of you in here are familiar with what P3 early school success is? If I could just see my audience. So a few of you have heard of our initiative. Um, we are in our 10th year of this initiative. We're fully funded by Marin Community Foundation, but it's in partnership with Marin County Office of Education. I'm funded by Marin Community Foundation, but I work for Marin County Office Office of Education, my name is Bonnie Barron. I coordinate this initiative for the county. Prior to this, and I'm in my second year at the county coordinating the initiative, but for seven years prior, I was a principal at one of the schools that was implementing the initiative. So I kind of have the group boots on the ground, um, work with this initiative, and now um, I feel really fortunate to just support schools that are trying to implement this initiative. Um, the initiative was started um, to be a five-year program, and the, the gift to us is that Marin Community Foundation has sustained their commitment. What happens often in education as, is that schools will try something for a couple of years and not get the results, and then they'll move on and try something else. And the gift we have with this initiative if that, is that we've been sustaining this work for 10 years, and we've learned so much. Because it's our 10th year right now, we're using it as a real pivotal year. We're looking at the last 10 years as kind of a research project. What have we learned? What are the important things that we need to keep and continue? And what are those non-negotiables that must continue with this? So the, the initiative started all about closing the achievement gap. Their marker was that third grade test score. It was back with No Child Left Behind. And in third grade, um, we, as educators, we were told that if we had our students fluent and proficient by the time they left us in third grade, their trajectory for their future would be on a upward, straightward uh, path for success. So we work so hard with that to get students to be fluent and proficient by the time they left third grade. One of the things we learned really early, that is when we get students in kindergarten, that gave us four years. 
And that's not enough time for a lot of our students. And so that's why we have the P in this initiative, and it's called P3. Do you know what the P stands for? Yeah, preschool. All of the schools in this initiative partner with preschools that feed into the elementary schools. And, and that's because we know we cannot do this work and support all of our students and what they need if we wait till they come to us in, third, in kindergarten if we're going to have them be proficient in third grade. We have to start when they're younger. In this county, we're really fortunate that there's actually a lot of other work, zero to five or zero to four. We don't start prior to four, just because we can't take it all on, but we do start with our preschoolers and we have partnerships, strong partnerships with our preschoolers. This P3 work is a national movement that we're a part of. So we didn't just think of it on our own here in Marin County. We're part of a national movement because across the country we're realizing we have to start much earlier with our families and our students. And that's because of brain research. And what brain research tells us is that from zero to five, those are the most critical years. And that's why we hear of all the family engagement and what's happening at the library and how are we gonna support our families and connect with our families? Because those early years, zero to five, are so critical. In our initiative, we actually talk about zero to eight. So that eight-year-old, that's a third grader. That's that same marker that we're working on in third grade. As an elementary principal for 16 years, Working in the school system, I can share with you that a lot of district work is looking at secondary support. When we have a unified district and we're working in a K-12 system, it's, we look at our high school students and say, what are we gonna do for our high school students? And we try all these programs and these Band-Aid fixes, but the real answer is that you pay attention when they're zero to eight. And that's what this initiative is trying to do. So we're grounded in brain research. That's part of our, our why um, that we do this work because we know it's critical um, that we uh, meet our students' needs um, as early as possible. That allows us to be proactive and um, instead of having interventions and su um, supports later that we put all of our efforts in the early years. Um, here's some of the research that also motivates us. Um, it's proven that um, the achievement gap is currently growing from birth to fifth grade. In Marin County, the achievement gap is huge. I had data in here, I, um, but I um, actually I took it out because I have such a short amount of time with you. But the achievement gap in Marin County between our uh, um, demographics, if you just look at demographic data, um, it's as much as 60 to 70, even 80 point spread. Um, and so that's the biggest motivator for us. This initiative, we, the schools we work with are all Title I schools. It's, we're, we're working with schools that are serving our uh, most needy students. Whoops, I skipped one. Um, this is the question that's currently driving our work. And um, every um, other year, we come up with a new question to kind of focus our work. Um, we uh, sent a team from Marin County uh, to Colorado to attend the P3 National Conference, and this team of eight of us met for a week um, and um, looked at data and um, tr uh, tried to decide wh where are we gonna move next, what's our next um, strategic step, and we decided to have this question guide our work, and if you've ever attended anything that we do with P3, this question's coming up over and over again. Um, and what it says is we know that institutionalized racism and poverty lead to predictable and inequitable student outcomes. Given that, how do we as involved adults interrupt this narrative? And this is probably our biggest question in Marin County. Um, so before dealing with academics and reading, remember that's, that's what this initiative was started on. How are we going to have them be successful and proficient readers by third grade? But what we know is that we, there's so much more we have to deal with before we get to the academics. And so equity work is a big part of our work and serving the whole child, including their family, actually takes the front seat to academics. So before we get to academics, we've done a lot of other work um, in our classrooms and with our families. These are the actual um, goals of our work, and I'm only gonna talk about a few of them. 
Um, the first one is the cross-sector work. That's that partnership with our preschools. That's critical to this success. Um, the learning environment, um, we've been working with um, Dr. Nancy Dome. Uh, prior to that, the, the, the Lindsay's, Dr. Randolph Lindsay, around equity work. And one of the things we um, spent uh, two or three years on was our school environment and our classroom environment. And here's a simple example of something that we did. We, we did what's called an environmental equity walkthrough. We walked through classrooms, but we tried to do it through the lens of equity. And one of the things we asked ourselves is, how hard should it be for a student to see themselves in the classroom? And that means students of color, if they're looking at their class library and they pull out a book, how many books do they have to pull out till they see themselves in that story? We did every single classroom, and little uh, exercises like that, we, we talk all the time, like little changes make big difference. Every classroom across um, the, our county that's part of this initiative now has classrooms that have equitable libraries in them. It was a huge push a couple of years ago. We looked at what's on the, on the wall, and um, is it telling the story of the students' lives? So one of the things we would do when we walked in the classroom, you'd look at where the teacher's desk is or where the teacher's sitting, and they'd have all their family pictures, and you know who their children are and what they did for their summer. But does the classroom represent the students? Um, and so looking at, um, again, environment before we get to academics, because remember, we're going to get to the academics, but before that, we had to make sure that kids felt like they were, uh, that they belonged in the classroom. We call it a sense of belonging, that they see themselves on the walls, in the books, in the curriculum. Most recently around equity, we've been looking at um, things that we call um, counter story or different perspectives, and that's across social studies. Like, who's telling this narrative? Who's telling the story about the history? Um, of whatever they're studying. And so teaching kids about the counter story or different perspectives. Again, part of our equity work. Um, the other um, big change that happened early on um, to make classrooms safe places, there used to be um, classroom management systems where students, um, if they were off task or disrupting the class, there would be some type of management system on the wall where they had to move their card you know, or clip up or down, or and you know, you started on green. That means you're having a good day, but then it would move to red, uh, or whatever the colors are if you made a bad choice. Um, so we have worked really hard to get all of those out of our classrooms, and the 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 reason is because we want classrooms to be safe places for kids. We don't want them to be to feel shamed um, or punished. We want them to feel safe so that they can take risks. So we've removed most of the classroom management. Um, the school that I was at, we did it all in one day. We talked about it in August at this um, Teachers meet one or two days before the school year starts, and we talked about it as a staff, and that day, every one of my teachers went back to their classroom and removed their pocket charts or their clip charts, and so that um, two days later, when the kids came to school, they were gone. And so you, you're wondering, like, well, how do you manage 20 or 30 students in your classroom without some type of a system? Our answer is through relationships. So our, our job is just to connect with all of our students and doing it through um, relationships and helping them. Um, we have very intentional social emotional learning. This year we're adding uh, trauma care um, for our students. So very intentional um, teaching kids um, how to um, make good choices and be responsible for their learning, negotiate and solve problems. Um, and so instead of teachers managing their behaviors with these punitive systems, we're teaching children to manage their behaviors and make good decisions. So it's a little bit of a shift, but remember those little shifts have made a big difference. And again, we haven't got to academics yet. This is all just like, what's the classroom environment look like? What's it feel like? How do people feel when they walk into the classroom? Are children feeling, and their parents, feeling like they belong? Um, one of the shifts we made was around um, family engagement. All of our schools now have family centers and community liaisons where families can gather. And that was an easy shift to make. But one of the other shifts that we made um, was a, around the way in, we engaged with parents. So I was a principal for 16 years. And um, 
for years, we would invite families into schools um, to talk to them about whatever the new curriculum was, or maybe we wanted to talk to them about attendance, or um, but, um, we wanted to talk to them about um, the data, their uh, school academic data scores. All of that was coming from the educators. It was us saying, parents come in because we want you to know something and we're going to tell you what we think you should know. And all of that has shifted now. We don't do any of that anymore. All of our parent nights, and we call it um, collectivist activities, it's all about engaging our families. We try and listen more than we talk. And that is because we, somebody said it earlier up here, we need our parents to partner with us in the same way we need our preschools to partner with us. Schools cannot do this without partnership with our parents. And so we do, we have have really shifted the way that we engage our parents. Parent-teacher conferences, it used to be the teacher that would do the talking and the parent would listen. The teacher cannot talk more than half of it. In a lot of cases, we're bringing the students in. Oh, did, am I shifting those? Because I don't mean to be. <laughs> Um, then, um, so the parent-teacher conferences have changed. The parent um, events have changed. Um, at Back to School Night um, last year, a year before actually, um, my last time I was a principal, usually the whole school comes into the auditorium and um, the principal introduces the staff and then I t have one thing that I think is really important for the parents to know, because remember I only get like 10 minutes with them on back to school night, and on my last back to school night, I did introduce my staff, I want this, the community to know who the teachers are, but um, during the day before the parents came, I had the fifth graders help me and there were 400 chairs, folding chairs, in the multi-use room, and under each chair, the fifth graders had taped a prompt, just a, a little sentence starter, under each chair. And so I used my time with my families um, to so that they could connect. And the prompts were, uh, and so when I, what I did is I told them, when I say go, you're going to reach under your chair and you're going to read your prompt, and then you're going to go find two or three people that you don't know and share re share your responses to the prompts. And this prompt was how do you, things like, how do you and your family spend Saturday afternoon? What's your and your family's favorite meal? And there were really simple questions, but the goal was to get our families in relationship as well. So again, coming back to the relationships. Um, the alignment piece is the hardest one we're working on, and that is that because we're trying to align our work with our preschool partners. We're trying to align preschool to fifth grade, and that's the academic piece. Sorry. I see a different thing on the computer than I see here, and I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe it's just slow. Okay, so I'll talk to you about the predictors. Um, since that's what you guys are looking at. Um, so we collect data, so this is now getting to the academics. So understanding that we've taken care of some of the culture and climate of the school, some of the environment, um, the way that we're um, supporting children with their behavior, the way that we're welcoming our parents into school, all that groundwork has to be laid, and then we can get to the academics. And that took us lots of years to figure out that until Everyone felt like they belonged at school and they were cared about and that, they um, that their voice was important and heard. Um, it was really hard to get to the academics for all our students. And then five years ago, um, we started working with a group called First School. It's Dr. Sharon Ritchie and Dr. Sam Ortweg. I had the privilege, um, MCF, Marin Community Foundation, sent me to Harvard for a week. There was a P3 national conference in Harvard. And I met uh, Dr. Ritchie there. She did uh, 30 years of research on school environments and how they're not set up for boys to be successful. There was lots of... Um, uh, sitting in your seats and lots of worksheets and lots of um, punitive um, discipline. And it was almost always to, towards boys. And when I first heard that as a principal, I started tracking who was being sent to the office, who was losing their recess, who was being referred to special ed. And it was across the board, lots of boys, and unfortunately, lots of boys of color. So the research that we learned from Dr. S um, Sharon Ritchie and Dr. Sam Ortrick also shifted our academics because they have uh, what they call predictors of success. And these are all research-based. Um, oh, then it did shift. <laughs> these, um, these predictors of success are all things that are proven 
um, that we need to spend more time um, in the classroom if we're going to get academic gains that we want. And um, the I'm going to read them because they're a little hard to see here. But we collect um, data on every single teacher twice a year. And then we meet with teachers and give one-on-one -on -one coaching on these, predi these seven predictors. There's actually 27 markers, but we focus on these seven. And it, it is how it is, we collect data on the experience of the child in the classroom minute by minute. So there's a data collector in the classroom all day long with the teacher, randomly collecting data on four different students. And we're, then we're able to tell, give feedback to the teacher. It's the biggest gift for teachers. Nobody sees the data but the teacher. And we're able to say, here's what it's like to be a student in your class. And we are able to tell them how much time they spend in small group versus whole group. Lots of research says that after 10 minutes in whole group, kids, have, every single kid has checked out. And so how do we do less whole group and more small group? And how do teachers know if they're doing enough small group? So we collect data on small group. And then these are the two that are most linked to um, literacy, which are um, the um, oral language and vocabulary development. And it's also um, key supports for our English language learners. And what we learn from Dr. Ritchie and Dr. Ortweg is we don't need a program. We don't need some scripted program to teach kids about English. When they're five, six, seven, eight, their, their brains are so ripe and ready to learn English, what we need is more opportunities for oral language and vocabulary development. And that's very intentional oral language and vocabulary development. And so through this process of data collection, we are able to give teacher, tell teachers at the end, this is how much time, how many minutes, so each percent counts for four minutes. So we are able to have these conversations of how much time are your children spending um, in these practices. The others up there are collaboration, metacognition, and scaffolded instruction. Um, but the two that um, are the, the largest with um, the, the highest influence on uh, third grade uh, reading scores are our language and um, vocabulary development. So, so here's, my, here's my last one, I know. And again, I can see it here. So, Having said all of that, this is not a program that we do. We're talking more about long-term change for teachers about their practice. But our, our real goal is that we get children and families to find joy and love in, their, in coming to school, in learning, and most specifically um, with reading. Sorry. There is a, a P3 conference that's a Bay Air, all the um, nine count, um, counties around the Bay Area are having a conference on P3 and early literacy um, next month. Oh no, this month, November. So I'm going to leave these um, here for you. I have to run because I'm doing stuff, this, sorry. Um, but I wanted to leave this in case you're interested and have time. There is a P3 um, conference on November 20th. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Bonnie. Carrie, that was a speedy tech transition. Excellent. We're so glad to have Carrie Bacho with us today. I'm just a tiny bit disappointed that you're not Little Red Riding Hood. And that's Little Red Reading Hood. So it is story time, it is story time. Circle round and sit down. When your ears are ready and your hands are steady, we will start the best part. Got your attention, right? Can't sing. So my name is Carrie Bacho, and I am the Early Literacy Manager managing the Raising a Reader program throughout Marin County. And as I said earlier in the introductions, um, Raising a Reader is a program of Parent Services Project. Now, Parent Services Project has been in existence for 39.9 years and was founded by our dear Ethel Siderman. <laughs> Ooh. And so for those of you who may not know what Parent Services Project does, the Cliff Notes version is it's a nonprofit that dedicates itself to the integration of family engagement in early childhood education settings, schools, and community settings in many different ways. But the way I do it, is through the Raising a Reader program. So, 
This is the story of Little Red Reading Hood. So once upon a time, there was a national crisis. One out of every three children entering kindergarten was entering without the basic literacy skills. They were entering 12 to 18 months behind the average kindergartner, and they would remain behind throughout their educational lifetime. Raising a Reader was created in 1999 in response to that national crisis. So what is Raising a Reader? It is a kit of red bags containing three to four age-appropriate books in each bag for a classroom. It is a rotation system that rotates these bags in and out of families' homes on a weekly basis. It is a shared story time opportunity between parent and child creating a positive connection with books. It is a way of creating a reading routine, a habit. It is an array of books, award-winning books, mixed diversity, bilingual, multilingual, STEM, financial literacy, exceptional diversity, etc. It is also background knowledge, which is essential for comprehension. And it is easy access to books. So how it works can be different in every school and actually in every classroom. But in general, what happens is a classroom gets a book kit. And then let's just say on a Thursday, each child will take a book bag home and share it with their family. The, the idea is that they take it home, they open it up, pull out the book, and have a shared reading experience with an adult in their house. Then they bring it back the following Tuesday, gives the teacher one day to kind of go through the book bags, make sure that they're complete, and then on Thursday, again, each child will take a different book bag home. Now think about this. If there are 25 book bags in each classroom, and there are four books in each bag, at the end of 25 weeks, that child will have been read to or shared a book with an adult so 100 books, 100 books in 25 weeks. And I'm not even counting the books that they get from my friends at the library. And I'm not even counting the books that they have on their bookshelves at home. So that's a lot of books coming through their home. And again, remember the topics, mixed diversity, bilingual, STEM, exceptional diversity. Then one day, eight years ago, a girl named Little Red Reading Hood came to Parent Services Project. She came all the way from her grandmother's house, deep in the forest, past the big bad wolf, to bring books to more families. So what does Marin Raising a Reader look like? First off, 85% of the families that we work with are low income, um, low literacy levels, low education levels. In other words, the majority of the families that we work with or I should say that Little Red Reading Hood works with, um, the majority of them did not even finish elementary school. Okay, and so they're English language learners, so low proficiency in English, or they don't speak English or read English at all. So currently, um, we have 2,000 children that are using this program in Marin County. When Little Red Reading Hood came, there was only 1,000. Then when she came, she doubled that. So what does that look like? That looks like 50 sites throughout Marin County that are implementing Raising a Reader. It, that means it's about 120 classrooms. And again, about 2,000 children. And it, it's not just the children that are taking the book bags home. What about their siblings? They may have one or two siblings. So how many more children these little red book bags are affecting? So Little Red Reading Hood had the idea to, to conduct story times for the children to show them just how much fun these books and these red bags could be. The story times were actually more like story adventures. And they came in all different types of adventures, kind of depending on what the children were studying in the classroom at the time. It could have been STEM or safety or math or friendship. But whatever it, whatever it was, um, it was also an opportunity to, do, to orient the students on 
the book bags, how to use it, why they're using it, and how to ask their parents to read to them. She also conducted workshops. Sometimes the workshops um, included the parents and children together. Sometimes it was just the parents. I prefer to have the parents and children together only because they're already away from their children the, you know, the whole day, and why keep them apart from their children another hour or two? And in this way, whatever they're learning in the workshop, they can implement right there on the spot and see it work right before their eyes. Okay, but Little Red Reading Hood did not limit, her, limit herself to the Raising a Reader workshops. She developed her own workshops according to the needs of the teachers and the families. So all the workshops that Little Red Reading Hood does, they all are practical, um, engaging, because I do remember, a uh, mother of young children, the last thing I wanted to do was go to a workshop at night. So I try to make sure that I don't waste their time, that they're engaged, that the hour to two hours that pass feels like 15 minutes. I mean, super engaged, hands on, and very practical. Never giving them ideas of things they can do where they have to go to a store to buy things. They can use things that they have in their home or just out in the community. Oh, here we go. Okay, so here are just a few examples of the workshops that were created. Um, and you're gonna hear a lot of uh, words and ideas that you already heard from all the other speakers. So literacy building blocks, there are eight building blocks. I'm not gonna do all eight building blocks here, but I just wanna give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So the first building block is oral language. That is the seed. That's where it all starts. But you need these building blocks to have a solid foundation, right? So when the children enter kindergarten, they can start to learn how to read. So oral language, I would share with a parent how to use a book from the red bag to support oral language. And then I would share with them an idea, an activity that they could do at home to really strengthen that concept or idea from the book. So here's just an idea. Who's ever done highs and lows at the dinner table? Yeah, I still do that with my, with my children. Okay, so the idea is, Kate, you're my daughter, okay? So my high of today is being here with everybody. My low for today is that I got up super early and, uh, and that's a bummer because I'm exhausted. So <laughs> Miss Kate, what was your high and low for today? Why? Hearing all of you speak, this is wonderful. And my low, poison oak. There we go. Oh no, and she just touched my microphone. Great. <laughs> but the idea is you want your children to answer in complete sentences. And then from, the, her, from her answer, I could say, oh my gosh, poison oak, where did you catch poison oak? And you would say? Trying to get a goat out of a poison oak bush. <laughs> Oh my, so you can see, you can expand on the answers and, and really strengthen oral language. We'll talk later. Um, STEM, STEM I created, uh, I'm sorry, Little Red Reading had created because one year uh, the families that I was working with, they had received this amazing booklet on STEM and it defined all the innovations and then it uh, gave activities that they could do at home. The problem was, they had no idea what it meant. Even though it was bilingual, they had no idea what STEM meant. And for those of you, does everyone here know what STEM is? So STEM is an acronym, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. Sometimes you'll hear STEAM, S-T-E-A-M, or STREAM, S-T-R-E-A-M. So, but Raising a Reader does STEM right now. And so that's what Little Red Reading Hood does. So how can, oh, well, and STEM is the way the, ch the children are learning in school now. It's their form of education. So how can a parent help support STEM outside of a classroom if they don't even know what it is? And the, the issue is also the majority of the jobs are gonna be in these fields in the future. So if they're not prepared, it's gonna be very difficult to get a job and make a living. So I created the STEM workshop. And 
as a, a parent of young children, I was so afraid to help my children with science. So I, prob I assumed that they were afraid as well. But then I showed them the definition, and I know it's really hard to read, but I'm gonna read it. The definition of science. Science is a way of thinking. It is observing and experimenting. It's making predictions, sharing discoveries, asking questions, and wondering how things work. That makes it a little easier, right? And it also helps parents realize, hey, we're already doing some of this stuff at home. So it's confirming what, they, what they're already doing, that they're doing a good job. And maybe now that they know what science is at this age, they can be more intentional and incorporate more of it at home. So for example, I would show a parent a book and how that would support those innovations. And then I would show them activity they can do at home. I'm not gonna do it here, but this is a, a liter bottle f uh, with a little bit of vinegar and air. And this is baking soda. Again, I'm not gonna do that because I was thinking about if I do this, I might set off the sprinklers again <laughs> and flood the place. So, and then of course, put the cork in there and then have a, a, an explosion happen and then do it again and again and again. Can you imagine how much learning will go on? And you don't have to be uh, you know, a professor to be able to teach science. It's just having a conversation about what they see, what they smell, what they taste, what happened. It's basic things like that. To us, growing up here, we, already, we know that that's what we're supposed to do and that's what we did with our children, but a lot of these families, they, they just don't know how to help. And so that's my job, is to help them realize that they can do it. Rhyme time is another one. When I was, uh, when I was uh, running the Kinder Academy in um, Novato many years ago, the teachers were saying, children don't know how to rhyme when entering kindergarten. And if you don't know how to rhyme, learning how to read is gonna be very challenging. Did you know that there are four very important reasons why rhyming is so important? Four reasons? Did you know that? I know, I didn't either until I started creating this workshop. So one of, there's oral, oral or excuse me, language development, cognitive development, um, social emotional development, and physical development. I won't get into all of them now, but I was just gonna give you um, an example of cognitive development. So cognitive development with rhyming. So nursery rhymes are like short stories, right? And so in a short story, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so they see that there is an order to things, there is a sequence, and once they learn that, then they learn to, or then they understand the idea of the story better, because they can follow along. Um, I just wanted to give you an example, the itsy bitsy spider. What happened first? The itsy bitsy spider went up the water spout, and so on. Something as simple as a rhyme, a song, can help teach that. Financial literacy workshop, but you're all wondering, oh, that's about money and math. It is, but it's also about sharing and charity and financial consciousness and work ethic. Just an example of one of the books. How to bring books to life. This is a fun one. There are children that just, you know, they can't sit for a story time. They're just not interested. So this is a workshop that shows how to incorporate props in a story time or sound effects, okay? So let's just say we're reading this story and Peter's walking through the snow for the first time. Imagine this sound effect during the story time. Okay, so it's engaging. It makes the, the book come to life. And the child can actually do the props and the um, sound effects. So they become part of the story time. Sight words is a big one. How can, how can adults, parents that do not speak English, that do not read English, help their children with sight words? It's imp almost impossible, but just in a nutshell, sight words, are words that don't follow phonic rules, and so children have to memorize these words. And as you can see, a lot of those words on that page are sight words. So if they can memorize those words, then they don't have to spend so much time decoding them, and they can have more, a, a more positive experience when reading. 
This is just one of the ideas. For example, one of the sight words, I, I use the um, Spanish alphabet to write the pronunciation of the word, and then I defined it. Then one day, the big bad wolf tried to blow the, our house down. The little red reading hood wasn't afraid. I'll go ahead and go to this one. She also thought of another way to get books into more families' homes, especially for those children who are not enrolled in a formal learning program, the ambassador program. So the children that are in home daycares and playgroups are the most isolated children and families and have the, le the least amount of resources. But 10 years ago, the ambassador program was started by Little Red Reading Hood and Parent Services Project. And what it is, it, there are volunteers in the community that may have been teachers in the past, that are parents that just want to learn more or just want to give back. I train them on how to choose an age-appropriate book, how to read it in an engaging manner, and then how to create an extension activity so the children understand the idea of the book, and then match them up with a home daycare or playgroup. I also give those uh, sites the book bags, and, and they do story times for all these places. So together, all the schools and libraries and parents and organizations and funders and ambassadors and Little Red Reading who closed the educational achievement gap, and all the children were able to read proficiently by third grade, and they all read happily ever after. Thanks, everyone, for your patience. We have a, a short closing presentation from Chantelle Walker um, from the library. And uh, yeah, nice, easy tech transition. Thanks for hanging in there with us. And thank you, Carrie. So what I'll say from here to make it easier, it's actually a great place to be. I probably have one of those louder voices, as Loretto mentioned. Um, but, you know, it's great to be a closer in a program like this, right? <laughs> Here we go. I think one of the um, really neat things about today is we started talking about literacy and quickly came to not only mechanics, but also community. And the few things that I'll say are really connecting us to literacy in this time and communities and equity. So for us, for example, I happen to be thinking about what a great change it'll be that in March we will actually have voting um, in California for the first time earlier in the primaries. And literacy is essential to that. Libraries are about democracy and about knowledge. And as I was thinking about this, last week I was reading a book by Toni Morrison, The Source of Self-Regard. And Toni Morrison says in her nonfiction book, literacy is power, literacy is essential, and the ability to connect to read connects to voting. And as we move forward as a group, I want us to think about the people who libraries offer the opportunity of equity to and access, no problem. I can do it without them. <laughs> um, offer equity and access to. We think about place. We are certainly offering access to materials, but we're about place and people, and we're tailored to that. Working and connecting together. One of the things that we do in partnership, and we have some great slides that we'd show you another time, <laughs> um, that look at the partnerships that we do have. But I want to encourage you, Lorenzo's question, uh, I thought was a very important one. What are things that we can all do together? One, continue on the path that we're on, asking critical questions. Two, as you think about what are the ways that you can support libraries, think about us as that nexus between literacy and community spaces and equity and inclusion. Share that in information. We're certainly an evolving institution. An example that you'll see around connecting to communities is partnership with the Department of Elections at the county and the League of Women Voters to celebrate 100 years of women's suffrage when white women got the vote originally, but also to think about what's modern voter engagement look like now? How are young people, we have a teen ambassadors um, signs that are up in our libraries, really saying, how do young people engage in that? How do we make sure that literacy is accessible to every family? So without further ado, I don't want to stand between you all and going to the learning bus, uh, which is right outside. Please do visit it. It's beautiful. And talk about libraries, the, 
the really evolving resources that we have available. Do support our library foundation. Donations are always welcome. But also, we're publicly funded. So ballot measures and things like that also support us. Thank you all. And I will let you go quickly. <laughs>